Apparently I'm supposed to make a fast-paced introduction to every film and hook you into upcoming dramas and amazing things to spike your sense of intrigue. So you watch the whole video and excite the algorithm and propel myself to internet stardom and unimagined wealth. But we roll a little bit differently on this channel, where we are trying to give you a real sense of what it's like to travel long term in a vehicle in Africa. And to be honest, it's very early in the morning. Good morning. <laughs> I've been wild camping for almost a month at the start of a year I spent Aldeed in Namibia, and I'm in a very friendly village in the very north of Namibia, where things are very, very slow and very, very relaxed. And also it's pretty hot and sticky. So what better way to start the day than having a very cold, non-alcoholic beer and watching the village and sun wake up to a new day. Pull up a chair and enjoy the sunrise. Watching the sun come up. A very persistent rooster for a while. And not sure, but I think some of these uh, people over here have been there all night. It's the only time of the day where it's vaguely cool. Quite happily not have a shirt on, for example. Myself, I'm gonna have a leisurely morning, uh -huh. and have a bit of breakfast. And then I think I'm gonna explore the sort of southern uh, middle part of the valley. Enjoying a uh, lemon drink. Oh. Right, let's uh, let the sun do its thing and come up and uh, let's get some breakfast and hit the road. I'm averaging on days that have won uh, canned product. <laughs> this morning I fancied cold baked beans from the fridge. It's been in there all overnight. And uh, yeah, again, trying to be a little bit humble in this environment if I start cooking porridge or eggs or something uh, you know these people don't have a lot uh, so that's better I can just eat inconspicuously and uh, yeah it's just better I think at least for me I don't know how they feel about it I'm sure it's not great when you uh, have a limited diet and someone turns up sort of you know scoffing exotic exciting things during the previous night I'd cut my foot on some glass left over from one of the many broken bottles lying in the sand. So a few of us organised a clean-up session, which the barefooted kids at least took to with great enthusiasm. So we've got the kids uh, currently running around. There was a little bit of cheating of smashing a bottle and picking up all the pieces. <laughs> But uh, it was quite smart, I have to say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was thinking that myself. I thought, oh, I would probably smash a bottle and <laughs> bring all the pieces. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. All right. There we go. Look at all that glass. There we go. Ah, oh, that's good. Wow. The little piece is very dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> to fill an entire shopping basket, and we're on the second one. Moro. Moro. <laughs> Altogether, it was a really pleasant and interesting stay in the friendly village of Okapembe. I can highly recommend it as the best and only place in Marion Flues to buy diesel and sawdust sausages. It would have been nice to stay longer, but the prospect of sitting and burning in the staggeringly laser-like sun all day wasn't appealing to my delicate Irish and Scottish skin. And at this time of the day, the light is so beautiful and invigorating that a drive down the main part of the valley seemed mandatory. And I was keen to see how much of its beauty I could capture for you. Oh, uh, really 
pleasant little experience uh, there. Nice people, very, you know, earnest. Because I got the extra diesel, I'm going to drive around Marion Flute a little bit more and just explore a, a few of the tracks that I haven't done so far. I've sort of done the, uh, the mountain pass, so to speak, so I'm going to sort of do a little bit of the, the river valley now. Just have a, a bit of a drive around, a bit of an explore. The valley is about 70 kilometres long. At the northern end is the Kanuni River, which forms the border of Angola, where we were in the previous episode. We took the higher and thinner route to the west of the dividing ranges in both directions. So today we'll be exploring the wider and lower part around here. It's a beautiful place. So it seems, uh, seems a shame to, to rush off when I got the opportunity to spend as long as I like here. There's nothing else happening. Very true, mate. It was a weird time in the world's history. And after a month of being stuck in Namibia, I had no idea how long it was going to go on for. I'm best when I have a project or goal to crack on with, so to avoid the uncertain feelings surrounding our collective disaster, I busied myself with continuing the process of learning to film with my new cameras. In case you missed the earlier episodes, I was still very much a beginner here, and the various cameras I'd run away to Namibia with were all still a bit of a mystery to me. One thing I learned quickly is that this camera had an unresponsive on-off button, so many times when I finished a shot and turned it off, it was still running, and I ended up with hours of accidental footage like this. And also quite a collection of accidental photos from its overly sensitive photo button. Just uh, playing around at the moment, trying to find a way to sort of capture how interesting and beautiful this place is. Uh, but it's very hard. I mean, basically, it's just rock. I mean, that's rock, right? <laughs> and uh, you know, I can I can do a close up of rock. I can do a wide angle of sort of the rock with. Nice colours, you know, clear blue sky and everything. Um, but it's, it's very difficult to capture it. Not sure how this looks. I mean, that's a huge, massive rock. Uh, but it, it looks kind of small on the little screen. You know, and any kind of zooming or panning doesn't really do justice. As you can see, um, there are some white sort of uh, streak marks um, coming down there. I do believe they are toilets. I know the name Rock Darcy, and I like a sort of fatter, uh, monocoloured guinea pig, really. A sort of like uh, smaller than a cat, but bigger than a guinea pig. And they tend to live in these rocks. They, they're quite sort of clean animals in the sense they seem to go to exactly the same place to go to the toilet each time. And that white is the sort of, you know, whatever chemical reaction of uh, of that. <laughs> There's a few more over here. I'm sure you'd like a, having taken you on a rock appreciation tour of Namibia, I'm sure you'd like to uh, have a rock toilet appreciation tour. So let's get you another shot. Ah, oh, look at that. The morning light on the rock and the toilets. <laughs> Uh, there's not much more I can say about that. I mean, that's all I know. <laughs> you may have noticed that sunglasses are mandatory out here, as the sunlight is extremely harsh and you'd walk around squinting all day without them. So it makes sense that a camera needs something similar. However, I wasn't quite sure how to use a variable neutral density filter properly. So this seemed as good a place as any to figure things out. So that's the, the minimum. Move around to two stops. We've gone from F14 to F13. Two more stops. We're down to F9. 
How does that look better? No idea. Two more stops, but we're getting a bit of a blur in the top left-hand corner there. Well, no idea. It's a relatively expensive indie filter. It's hard to see out in the field as a trouble, but we're F16. Oh, F16 versus F3.5, which is basically unusable. Having completely mastered exposure, or whatever an indie filter does for you, it was time to move on to my biggest filming stress, talking to the camera. It's a very hard skill to master, especially in these hot, albeit stunning conditions. But at least nobody was around for miles, so I could relax and take confidence in the fact that no one would ever see the footage. Right, so how do you do this uh, presenting in the desert? Yeah, good day. <laughs> A power stance, I think, shouldn't I? Some sort of... I don't know, hang on, you've got to do the politician sort of legs apart. I am a desert warrior. Nothing can stop me in my Land Rover. Except a lack of diesel. It's hard to have the energy to think of what you're going to say, but you can't really script it beforehand because then you just sort of become a... Um, you know, a point and shoot travel show, which is pretty dull. Pulled up under a tree just next to the track to uh, take in a bit of a, the beauty of Marion Fluss. So it's hard to think of the correct and articulate and concise way to say something when you're in the desert, in the field, making it up as you go along. And I actually piecing it together a story here that's interesting. So we've mastered that. Okay, well, I think that's the uh, crowning glory of Marion Fluss. It's the biggest sort of cliff face and the most interesting piece of rock, I think. It's just one big piece rather than all the jagged bits. So it's something a bit different. All right, so I'm just trying to look at the little screen. Yeah, Drew's uh -huh. out. Leave your comments below. Have I got it wrong? Are they not in fact toilets? What are they? It's the great toilet mystery of Marion Fluss. <laughs> what I will say though, it's it's a ah, it's a beautiful piece of scenery, it's a beautiful valley. But the whole of the whole of northern Namibia is uh, the northwest especially. Some of the other parts of the the north are a little bit uh, flat and dry and so so. Let's get a shot from that angle and uh, we'll drop the to toilet talk and do more of a sort of uh, I'm a famous explorer on my travels visiting these magnificent sites and aren't they magnificent and aren't I brilliant for coming here? Isn't it incredible? How did I make it? Battling the elements and the, you know, the local people and lack of cappuccino, my iPhone doesn't work in somewhat strange mood this morning, as you can tell. I think it's a, a few, day, few days of drinking too many sugary uh, beverages. And So we're going to continue on uh, down this track to the bottom of the valley there, uh, just to the left of the mountains on the left. To try and give some sense of scale to the monstrous rock mountains, I thought I'd film myself at the base of this one, next to this huge boulder that appears just as a small rock at the bottom of the shot. But stepping out from the shade of the landy is a brave move, as you really start to feel a sense of being burnt alive. This area has the most ferocious sun I've ever experienced. Quite a big boulder, isn't it? That would have been fun uh, camping <laughs> in the tree next to it when that started to come down. Now, is this tree on the left, is it dead? Or is it struck by lightning? There's a question for the experts, because it looks sort of burnt. We're going to avoid the snakes that will just be coming out now to warm up. This looks like the least snaky way up. Alright, let's go. 
Here's the car. All right. Hello, Land Rover. That's me. Under a boulder. And here's me next to the boulder. It's a good size. Right, terrific. We avoided snakes. So you've seen the boulder at the bottom of the cliff, and then we're going to go bang. Ooh, another patch of green. Yay for green. It's pretty good green considering they've had one day of rain a month ago, as they said. Water tanks up ahead, so I'm guessing this is where they store their, uh, their goats because it's got the water, so they're pumping it up. There's a solar panel pumping the water up into the tanks and they're able to keep the goats alive. Okay, so we're in the riverbed, which is fine. What we want is a track off to the right or actually going the opposite direction to this one. But we will just uh, take what we can get for now because it was there's absolutely no track through the sand in the opposite direction that I could see. And I'm hoping at some point this will cut across and magically find us another route. And cut it does. So we have now turned around and are heading south, back down the valley. Mount Ondao. There we go, that's Mount Ondao. What is it? Ah, it's a springbok. Ah, it's a pleasant little drive in a woodland. Certainly nice to drive on a bit of sand, get out of the corrugations. We're also more likely to see uh, a bit of wildlife on the river here. Oh, I'm enjoying this drive, the sand is lovely. It's nice and smooth, you can get a little bit of speed up sometimes. Scenery is fantastic. And now it started to become a little surreal as well. The more we drive on, the more it was like we'd driven into a lush green valley in Switzerland. And for change we actually got some African wildlife instead of cows and goats. The humble, yet very elegant and beautiful springbok. Also an amazing amount of dragonflies here, <laughs> which is quite cool. Let's see if they show up or not. Can you see them? I certainly can. Yeah, well, look at them all. They're out here enjoying life, obviously. There's another view of the mountains we were just looking at earlier. We're taking the path uh, from left to right. So we went down those mountains on that side and did a sort of U-turn into a different track. And we're taking the most easterly route now up the valley and we're going to head up to the entrance for Van Zyl's Pass. Just trundling along and we came into a small valley and there's a whole bunch of ossages in there. As soon as I saw them I killed the engine. 
The ostriches are very scatty. If they were a, a bit closer and sort of not walking away, I'd get. I've got a proper zoom lens, but uh, it's a bit of a risk changing the lenses and the dust and everything. And then I need to get the tripod on, and I get the feeling by the time I've done that, these ones are going to disappear over the horizon. Apologies for that. We'll get into some proper wildlife filming a bit later on. Trust me, we seriously do soon. I'm not getting very far today. It's a beautiful little valley. Lots to stop and see and do. It's very photogenic. Yeah, so really enjoying, really enjoying the drive. Wow, this valley is green, 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 green. Look at this one. We might do a bit of uh, camera top action on this one. A bit reluctant to stiff on the grass, but the ostriches are all over it, so I think we're okay. These are the, uh, I don't know what they're called, circles <laughs> that appear in the grass. I'm assuming it's just people creating them. There's a couple in a row, one here, one over there. It's uh, nice, eh? There's a whole bunch of ostriches up on that hill. More ostriches over there. Lots of dragonflies. As far as you can see, just a green valley. These were the routes that I came up 10 years ago that I remember all this grass was bright, sort of yellow, much taller. And it was a big open valley full of grass, it was beautiful. So it's, uh, yeah, it's quite surreal to see it quite differently. It's 10 years time, so of course your, your mind plays tricks on you, it changes things around. So it's interesting to see the reality of it again, and also interesting to see it uh, green in such a different state. Just having a moment in the grass, sitting, watching the ostriches, enjoying the greenery. It's like being home in New Zealand and sitting in a paddock. A few less ostriches. Been doing a bit of Landy Pawn, uh, a few pictures. It's great how I colour coordinated the Land Rover with the landscape, isn't it? Sometimes I wonder if I get in the way of you developing your own thoughts as we visit these remote and beautiful areas. So I like to include some quieter scenes, without me narrating, so you can form your own impressions of travelling through this amazing country. I'm also releasing a lot of interesting and beautiful footage via the YouTube channel memberships and on Patreon. Please have a look and help support the channel if you're able. Righto, that's self-promotion over with for another year. The mighty old land here. Eh? I've owned it for 20 years. Lived in it for well, on and off for about five years on different trips, I guess. I've done well over 300,000 kilometres together. Visited over 50 countries. And she's only just getting started. I want to burst into song, something about the green green fields of something or other and the lush green this and... Wow, just beautiful, 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 beautiful green! It's so green! It's incredible! Out in the desert, eh? <laughs> Green! Well, that didn't last long. A uh, good few kilometres of green and we're into just pure harsh sand now. So, not sure what's uh, wrong with this sand that the grass doesn't grow. I can see some water 
sort of runoffs maybe, I'm not sure. Anyway, uh, that was fun while it lasted. So we've now got some nice harsh sand to get through. Well, harsh as, harsh as in it looks harsh, but it's actually quite nice to drive on. All right, uh, yeah, so entering the orange dunes. So we've had it all. We've had uh, dark green, bright white, and now a beautiful orange sand. It's, uh, it's a lot like being in Australia, to be honest. We're he heading up uh, towards Van Zyl's Pass. It comes over this uh, pretty extraordinary mountain range. It's a bit overrated in my view. Um, it's sort of one of these Southern African things. Yeah, I mean, it's beautiful, it's nice and that, but it's not sort of hardcore off-roading. Other than a few stretches which are a bit challenging, basically need to. My South African mate Daniel has been wanting an old landy for years, and I've spent quite a bit of time trying to find him one to buy without success. So I was brilliantly surprised and happy to stumble on the perfect restoration project for him way out here. Great to say here we have a, a very, very sad sight. It's an old landy. It uh, no longer drives. A familiar dashboard. The curves of the doors. <laughs> Those window vents we can see through at the top. Chassis is in pretty good shape. Look of paint, red oxide. Good as new. Bit of welding. but Slightly twisted chassis at the front, but uh, oh, I've got some mates that could sort that out in a few minutes. It's a good time to get a shot of my solar panel, by the way. It's uh, discreetly hiding on top. And we've got an Anderson plug there, which just unplugs. And I can plug it into a foldable one on a 10 meter extension when I'm parked in the shade. So good news. We've been almost dying of thirst out here in the desert and I finally found some water. Doesn't look the most appetizing and the cows uh, don't seem the most hygienic when it comes to <laughs> where they drink and where they plop. It'd keep you alive for a day or two until you died of whatever bacteria was in it that you drank. <laughs> so it could be a spring underground or it's actually just rained from the big storm a couple of nights ago. Certainly nice being the first on the corrugated sanded tracks after a bit of rain. It's nice and smooth, really pleasure to drive on. Putting along in third gear. Uh, there's a little bit of shake now and then like this, but generally just smooth, smooth. I could drive around the whole entire world on a little sandy dirt track with no corrugations. It's fantastic. It doesn't take long before the sun is high enough to remove the beautiful morning light and you get the oppressive feeling of being a bug under a sun-backed microscope. So generally the best thing to do during these suffocating midday hours is to drive around exploring, as at least then you have some breeze and distractions to help you get through the day. I'm just letting you know how things really are, rather than complaining by the way. I love the whole experience of being here. I ran away from a comfortable home to get here. So rather than offer just a highlighted postcard picture view of only the beautiful bits, it's a warts and all experience, as one of my favourite bands would say. But you certainly have to suffer at times to experience things fully. I thought I'd go and have a look at the riverbed to the south of the infamous Van Zeel's Pass to see how much water had come down two nights ago when I'd watched a storm over the top of the mountains. That's sort of the, the end, if you like, of Van Zeel's Pass. Anyway, if you've heard the name, if you've always wondered what it's about, it's basically uh, getting from the other side of those mountains to here. And then you come straight down there, straight down the riverbed, and you're out into Marion Fluce. So, it's a nice, uh, oh, it's a nice drive. A couple of slightly hairy bits, but that's about it. So yeah, give it a go one day if you can. Kind of looking for that really, really big tree. Now I've got some baboons on the left there. At times it's also nice to just stop and sit, to turn off the noisy engine and have a rest with the birds. Timber leopards keeping me safe so far.
this stage, I was spending a lot of time feeling hungry, to be honest, as it had been around three weeks since I'd had the chance to buy any fruit or vegetables, and meat had been limited to only the goat from the previous evening. Plus, I'd exhausted the available diesel supplies. So with a heavy heart, I decided to head out south, over the very rocky mountains towards Apua, a rough-and-ready frontier small town that at least had a semi-well-stocked supermarket and mobile phone reception to get some nutrition and check in with the world to see how things were developing. Thanks for joining in the journey with me. I'll see you on the very rocky next episode, which Toyota fans will enjoy as the landy starts to leak badly, as does Darren, the not uh, very good a mechanic. Bit painful, quite a good slice actually. Stop pulling the dice and just compromise It's the chance of your life